Chapter 29, uh, Wilsonian progressivism at home and abroad. We're going to be talking about uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was going to win the election of 1912. Let's talk about that election. Uh, the Republicans, uh, obviously, they're going to, uh, you know, you got a president in Taft who is a Republican, and he's been president for four years with definitely mixed um, results. Uh, there's a lot of people within the Republican Party that don't like Taft because he wasn't Roosevelt. Roosevelt, in fact, uh, who, you know, really convinced Americans that Taft was the guy to continue things the way he wanted, was upset with Taft and some of the things that he did that we talked about in the last chapter, especially, you know, trying to get rid of the trust that was United States Steel, the firing of the Secretary of the Interior that was a Roosevelt guy. So uh, there was a lot of dissension within the Republican Party. TR wants to throw his hat in the ring, this quote about, uh, you know, throwing his hat, hat in the ring and, and uh, you know, uh, wanting to run again. Um, he came back from his uh, safari, I guess you could say, reinvigorated. He was still hurting a little bit from the malaria that almost killed him there, but he was fit enough to run. In fact, he said when someone asked if he was fit enough to run for president, he says, I'm as fit as a bull moose. And that's why they called it the bull moose party. It was really known as the progressive party and they came to be known as the progressive bull moose party. And it says here, my hat is still in the ring. That was one of his quotes. Um, uh, here's the things that he promoted in his <laughs> bull moose party. Basically, more of everything and bigger everything that he stood for when he was president between 1900 and 1908. Uh, he called his program not square deal, but new nationalism, more government involvement, bigger increases in the military and more intervention in Latin America. I mean, heck, he was one of the most popular presidents of all time. So he just figures I'll put more and bigger in front of everything and I'll win. Um, but there were people who were talking about, hey, you know, this guy is going to be running for what essentially would be a third term. And there was a tradition to not uh, run for a, a third term term to, uh, you know, have it only be a tradition. It, it has been at that time a tradition set by George Washington um, that would, uh, you know, say that after two terms you leave there it wasn't set in stone like it is now a rule a law constitutional law but there was just that idea that hey let's follow the footsteps of the first president of the united states who said we should have rotation in office but anyway that didn't matter to roosevelt he was still going to run here's some of the things he promoted the progressive bull moose party promoted women's suffrage graduated income tax inheritance tax for the rich lower tariffs, limits on campaign spending, currency reform, minimum wage laws, social insurance, abolition of child labor, all those are very progressive, right? You better be progressive, workman's compensation. The other, um, the other opponent here in this election was Eugene V. Debs, who because of the growing gap between the rich and the poor, the Socialist Party is becoming more and more um, popular amongst those poor people. And uh, yeah, Eugene V. Debs was, was their candidate. This is gonna be the third time he's run and he's gonna win more votes than ever, really. It, at the end of the day, Woodrow Wilson is able to pull out a victory in the 1912 election and which looks like a massive uh, landslide victory. And I, I guess if you look at the uh, electoral college vote, which is all that matters really, it is a massive victory. But when you also look at it closely, you come to find out that, hey, uh, Wilson won only 41% of the popular vote. That's a little bit more than Abraham Lincoln won uh, in 1860. So he wasn't a guy that got a ton of votes, but he got enough votes in states to win. And the reason he did that, the reason he was able to do that is because of the political suicide, right? The fact that the Republican party split in two with the bull moose party and the Republican party. Same thing if you, and you don't want a connection in history as you go back to the 1860 election, the political suicide committed by the Democrat party that year when they went Northern Democrat, Southern Democrat, when the Southerns walked, Southerners walked out and nominated John C. Breckinridge. So really a lot of votes were taken away from 
um, the Republicans because of the split in the party. It says here, the seas of opportunity open for the Democrats. Yes, the fact that there was a split in the party really was opportun opportunity there. So you see it from a different perspective, you know, you see it's only 42% of the popular vote here, but 82% of the electoral vote. The split in the party, 100% uh, leads to the victory uh, for Wilson. If you look at the popular votes, uh, they would have been, if you add Roosevelt plus Taft, um, they definitely would have had more popular votes than Wilson had. A little bit about Dr. Woodrow Wilson. He was a doctor of political science. He was very strong progressive Democrat. He's all about progressivism. And most candidates were, but Wilson was even more extreme than most. He was a former president of Princeton. Very, very uh, bright, very articulate. Came from... Um, a religious background. His father was a preacher. Sometimes Woodrow Wilson acted like a preacher um, when he was talking, which kind of graded on people. He was very good for the common man, but if you would meet him personally, you know, he, he'd give you a cold handshake and he wasn't a very personable guy. Um, he couldn't stand to be <laughs> amongst people who weren't his academic equal, which is probably 99.999% of the population wasn't Woodrow Wilson's uh, equal when it comes to how smart he was. He's after all has a PhD. He's only the second Democrat president since 1861. The other was Grover Cleveland with his two non-consecutive terms. He was eloquent, well-spoken, religious, arrogant, and intolerant of stupidity. Pretty much sums up Woodrow Wilson. And there he is there. Uh, Wilson's program. So, you know, you've had, pre had, you know, Roosevelt call his a square deal. Now Wilson said, well, I'm going to name mine new freedom and new freedom was again, I'll repeat this all about progressivism, favored small enterprise, desire to break up all trust, you know, not, not Roosevelt's break up the bad trust, keep the good trust philosophy. He was hey, every trust is a bad trust. He, uh, wanted to, he had a very, uh, ambitious program he wanted to assault the triple wall of privilege the rich people assault the triple wall of privilege and the three areas that he wanted to assault change tweak tariffs banks and trusts really remember that triple wall of pri privilege the tariffs the banks and the trust and he's going to do it it's such a it's such a uh, huge ask for congress that he went and he personally addressed Congress with a State of the Union address. And he broke with tradition, a tradition that was set by Jefferson that you don't talk to Congress, that you write it and someone else reads it for you. He went back to what Washington and what Adams did is they personally addressed Congress. He's gonna do that. Every president since Wilson has personally addressed Congress. So first off his attack on the tariff, the first in the triple wall of privilege. All progressives wanted to lower the tariff. They are beginning to see that the tariff is holding them back. To because uh, when we have a high tariff, other countries would do the same, and it really shuts down international trade. So he was successfully signed the Underwood Tariff Bill. He convinced Congress to to pass it. It passed the House. It passed the Senate. It got to his desk, and he signed it. It was the first substantial lowering of the tariff since before the Civil War. Right. And, and it also contained a, a stipulation in there that you could tax incomes, which will eventually evolve into the 16th Amendment, which we now permanently can um, go and, and tax incomes like we're doing right now. Taxes are due pretty soon in April. The second is attack on banking. The banking system in the United States was old. It was worn out. It was no good anymore. The country has gotten bigger uh, the population is huge to think that you're going to be able to rely on a gold standard is, is narrow thinking it's, you need to be able to expand the money system or re contract it in some cases to be able to control inflation, deflation, those kind of issues that went on. So the federal reserve act was signed by Woodrow Wilson, simply put, and arguably the most important piece of legislation ever passed by United States Congress. It's very, very important today. 
they've done a tremendous job in keeping a lid on inflation and deflation. They've been able to control that with some, you know, hiccups along the way, but they're, they continually learn from what they're doing. So what this Federal Reserve Act did was it basically took us off the gold standard and uh, it set up a system where you had 12 Federal Reserve banks, as you see in this uh, map right here. The Federal Reserve Bank that serves our area in Monterey County is in San Francisco. Um, and they serve service all these states here. And then there's one in Minneapolis up there, one in Kansas City. Well, there's a board of governors located in Washington, DC. It's a 10 member board, the Federal Reserve Board. There's a chairman of the Federal Reserve who's a very powerful person. And they meet periodically and they discuss all econ economic indicators like the, the gross national product, uh, the, the gross domestic uh, product. They're going to look at air, all econ economic indicators and they're going to look at the economy. Is the economy going too fast? Are too many people buying cars and houses and refinancing their homes and using their credit cards? If that's the case, it'll lead to inflation. So they're gonna slowly increase the interest rate, the rate that we pay for loans, the rates that we pay on our interest rates that we pay on our credit cards. So if they wanna slow down the economy, they're gonna raise the interest rate, which people will stop buying cars and they'll stop buying houses or it'll slow it down. They'll, they won't use their card as much though. So if you slow down the economy, you would prevent inflation from happening. And it's a juggling act. That's why this board meets all the time and they look at the economic indicators and they make those decisions as to whether they're going to raise or lower the interest rate. And it makes a huge difference. So the Federal Reserve System has been tremendous for this country. You know, obviously we went through the Great Depression and everything was new, but it, we've gone through ups and downs, but they're doing a fairly good job. Now, I wanted to talk about the money supply um, here in the United States. There, how do, I, I doubt most of us have seen any of these. I sure haven't, but there are $500 bills out there that are produced by, the, if you've been to Washington, D.C., there's a, a mint there that they coin money. Uh, they make bills. I don't think they're making $500 bills anymore. In fact, they stopped making them in 1969. There's still some out there. There was a $1,000 bill. They stopped in 1934. Number of bills still in circulation, 165000 thousand dollar bills pretty pretty amazing All right, and there there was a five thousand dollar bill not gonna, there's 342 james madison is on that bill secretary of state salmon chase has is on the ten thousand dollar bill how about the hundred thousand dollar bill the president that we're talking about right now woodrow wilson unknown how many are out there in circulation but surely not very many of them the money situation today, I thought this was pretty interesting here. Coins and banknotes are a rare form of money anymore, right? Dollar bills and, and coins, rare. The sum total of money in the world is about $60 trillion. The sum total of coins and banknotes is less than $6 trillion. More than 90% of all money, uh, more than $50 trillion appearing in our accounts, exist only on computer servers, and you'll never see that money. Accordingly, most business transactions are executed by moving electronic data from one computer file to another without any exchange of physical cash. No surprise there. I think most people know that. All right. The other, the triple wall of privilege was the attack on trust to try to eliminate trust. And it's just like really difficult to keep up with the really smart, rich business people like JP Morgan and Rockefeller. So the Federal Trade Commission Act was passed in 1940 which empowered the president to investigate trust and watch over. It's, it's really a watchdog organization that watches the really rich, smart people that are always finding loopholes. And then once you find that loophole, then you patch that loophole. All right. So that's what, what this, uh, the federal trade commission act did. Um, and it's still around today. An example of a patch that was created by the federal trade commission act was the Clayton antitrust act which uh, really helped patch Sherman antitrust. Remember Sherman antitrust that was um, more successful in, in shutting down labor unions than, than it was anything else. Like it was meant to, to control big business, but big business used it to control labor unions. 
that this patch prevents that from happening. Sometimes they call it the Clayton Antitrust Act um, labor's Magna Carta, like founding document. It allows labor unions to exist without being shut down by Sherman Antitrust. So it's a patch created by the Federal Trade Commission Act. So these two bills were signed by Woodrow Wilson. So his attack on trust, great example there. Wilson in foreign affairs, he inter intervened quite a bit. He ended task dollar diplomacy, right? N no longer wanted people to invest in other countries. He sent Marines down to Latin American countries. Um, in Mexico, he intervened down there to, to try to find Pancho Villa, who was crossing over the border to attack Americans. Um, and, and he got, and, until we got involved in World War I. And then he pulled General John Pershing from Mexico, chasing after Pancho Villa, who they never found. And they brought him to go to World War I. So, um, you know, World War I is, is really brewing here. Um, a lot of things ha are happening worldwide. Um, and I like to the, use the analogy that there is a lot of gasoline being spread all over Europe that is going to help lead to World War I. You know that if you, the act of spreading gasoline doesn't necessarily create fire. What does create fire is when you strike a match. And if there's gasoline everywhere, it's going to turn into a big inferno. And that's what's going to happen with the beginning of World War I. Now, what do I mean by spreading gasoline? I mean, countries taking over other countries uh, for imperialistic reasons, for, you know, because keeping up with the Joneses, other countries are doing it, we should do it too. Um, or they're doing it for economic gain, or they're doing it for pride and prestige, but it's happening. And that's the, the uh, metaphorically spreading of gasoline. Um, when it comes to the match that started it, it was the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was heir to the throne of the Austria-Hungary Empire. He was sent on a goodwill mission to Sarajevo. Um, there he is there. I'm going to use this map right here. Sarajevo, Sarajevo um, located right down here. Uh, Serbia, Austria-Hungary, you could see here, is allied with Germany, and they're taking over a lot of territory in these areas. The, the, the uh, empires are expanding. Other countries are starting to get nervous that they're going to be taken over by Austria-Hungary. The one that is very nervous would be Serbia. A Serbian nationalist, a, a college student, decided to take matters into his own hands. And when Austria-Hungary sent Franz Ferdinand and his wife down here to soothe things over in Sarajevo after the takeover of this territory, uh, the Serbian nationalist student decided to come over and assassinate him, which he successfully did. The killing of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand by the Serbian nationalists is going to be the spark that starts World War I. So you're going to get uh, some, obviously, the, uh, uh, there's Franz Ferdinand there. But look, going back to this, uh, the, the king of, of Austria-Hungary is furious, and he goes to Germany and asks permission to declare war on Serbia. Serbia was allied with Russia. And Russians said, whoa, you don't pick on our ally. And Russia then announces full mobilization, like they're going to get ready for war. Germany then jumps in and declares war on Russia. And then, but first, and I'm going back to this map, you know, when Germany declared war on Russia, they also declared war on France. And they decided to uh, attack France first before they attack Russia. One thing they, that Germany knows, they know their history and they know that Russia takes a long time to mobilize for war. And in all likelihood, if Germany would have attacked Russia, it would have been a long dragged out war. So they decide, and then they feared getting backdoored by France and they'd be fighting a two front war. So their goal was, hey, we're gonna take care of France first and then we're gonna turn on Russia and Russia will take a long time to mobilize. They're going to take it one country at a time. So Germany attacks France, declares war on, after declaring war on Russia, declares war on France. Once the attack happened here in France, Great Britain gets involved and declares war on Germany, and World War I is on. All right, this whole thing started down here. Serbia is going to have a small, um, you know, role in the war, but that, that's where this thing's going to start. The Triple Entente would be 
uh, Russia, France, the British Isles, Italy, Empire of Japan, and later on the United States, where the central powers consisted of Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. Um, now, what the United States is going to do is they're going to try to stay the heck out of this war. They're going to do everything in their power to stay out, and they're going to benefit financially. What they're benefiting financially for them meant they were going to um, supply both sides. Why not supply the Germans and the French and the British with goods that they need? It's an opportunity for Americans to make money. They're very interested in making money on that. Uh, but then pretty soon that both sides started to figure it out that the Americans are supplying both sides and they, uh, there's going to be uh, consequences to that. Uh, Germans are going to uh, announce full submarine warfare along the British Isles. The Germans have strong, strong Navy with their uh, submarines, very strong, and they're going to uh, declare uh, declare war 